the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hail Mary, the great source, so with thee, blessed art thou, and the blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. So we are on lesson 24th on the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. And so the bread and wine, of course, are changed into the body and blood of Christ at the consecration of the Mass. Um, I'm sure everyone knew that. Um, and to make it obvious, right after the consecration, the host that is now consecrated in the chalice with precious blood are elevated. That's why we have those moments and you're encouraged during those moments to make a prayer such as my Lord and my God. When you see, um, you know, inwardly we don't need to pray all prayers out loud, but um, inwardly we're encouraged to make an act of adoration to our Lord when we see um, his body and blood elevated right after the consecration. The Mass, of course, the unbloody sacrifice of the body and blood of Christ. The sacrifice is called Mass, very probably because the words ite mis est, used by the priest at the end of the Mass, tells people to depart when the Holy Sacrifice is ended. A sacrifice, of course, is an offering of an object by a priest to God alone. And the consuming of it to acknowledge that he is the creator and the Lord of all things. The Mass is the same sacrifice as that of the cross because the offering and the priest are the same. Christ, our blessed Lord, and the end for which the sacrifice of the Mass is offered are the same as those of the sacrifice of the cross, namely the salvation of the world, the forgiveness of sins. So the ends for which the sacrifice of the cross were offered for to be honored and glory to honor and glorify God, to thank Him for all the grace that's bestowed on the whole world, to satisfy God's justice for the sins of men, and to obtain all graces and blessings. The fruits of the Mass are distributed thus. The first benefit is bestowed on the priest who says the Mass, the second on the person for whom the Mass is said, or for the intention for which it is said, the third to those who are present at Mass, particularly those who serve it, and the fourth to all the faithful who are in communion with the Church. Um, you know, this of course is a basic catechism, but if you get it in a little deeper, what the church teaches is that, that there are um, several different fruits of the Mass. The first is called the general Mass fruit. The general Mass fruit does not depend on the holiness of the priest in any way, only depends on whether or not the Mass is valid, and it benefits the entire world. The entire world is better off because a Mass has been said. Whether the priest was even in the state of grace, it doesn't matter because Christ himself is presenting, is representing re re his sacrifice. And so the entire world is better off because that Mass has been said. This is what St. John Vianney said, when the world would sooner last uh, uh, without the sun than without the Mass. And believe me, uh, we wouldn't last very long without it. If the sun were simply taken away from us, we would freeze to death pretty quickly. So um, the, uh, the, the Mass, of course, benefits the whole world. But the second fruit of the Mass is the special Mass fruit. That is that for which the Mass is being offered. So a person or persons living or deceased. That, too, depends on the merits of Christ. It does not depend on the holiness of the priest. It doesn't depend on the form of the Mass. So it doesn't matter if you offer your Mass in the traditional rite, in the no Ordo, in one of the Eastern rites. All Masses, in this sense, are completely equivalent. They are all worth the same because it is Christ himself who is the victim, Christ himself who is the priest, and they are all equivalent in that way, so it doesn't make sense when people are, you know, think that, you know, one Mass is more valuable than another in the sense it isn't. This, this Mass fruit, the special Mass fruit, is the same for all Masses. Now we get to the personal Mass fruit, and here's where the quality of the Mass will count. The personal Mass fruit is that fruit that I, as a priest, and you, as the people present, will gain from attending that Mass. Now, it's true, every Mass that we attend 
is meritorious to some degree. But it's going to make a difference whether we're there and really focused on the Mass and really trying to offer ourselves in union with Christ at that Mass, or whether we're distracted, thinking about all those sorts of things, or whether we're angry because the priest is doing something that he's not supposed to do because it's not called for in the Mass. The great story is that sometimes when people get older, they kind of lose their inhibitions to 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 be quiet. And there was a mass at um, in Philadelphia where the priest would would tip, would always go say, uh, "Is anybody's birthday today?" And, and and this old woman would say, right out loud for everyone to hear, "What's he doing?" That's not part of the Mass. Why is he doing that? <laughs> and I have to say, I mean, of course, the priest asked for that. He shouldn't be doing that. She's absolutely right. But that poor woman and other people who maybe are not as vocal about it, who are just getting mad and thinking the same thing, what's this priest doing? Should be doing that during Mass. That's not having us enter in very much to the holy sacrifice of the Mass. It's getting us annoyed. And well, it can even be a justifiable anger. It's still not the same as going to a reverend Mass and really being able to enter in. We will gain more fruits through that Mass when we're truly able to con concentrate and pray than we would from a mass where we're getting annoyed and angry or are distracted in life. And so those are the, the personal mass fruits. And so for that reason, I, I like to give the advice that Mother Angelica used to give. Mother Angelica used to say, don't go to an electric church. And she said, you want, you want to know what an electric church is? An electric church is where every time you go, you get a shock. You don't want to go to a church like that. You want to go to a church where you can really deeply enter in to the mystery and the sacrifice that our Lord is repre representing for us. So this is why the Catechism teaches, all masses are equal in value in themselves and do not differ in worth but only in the solemnity with which they are celebrated or in the end for which they are offered. Masses are distinguished thus. So when the Mass is sung by a bishop, assisted by a deacon and subdeacon, it's called a pontifical Mass. When it is sung by a priest, assisted by a deacon and subdeacon, it's called a solemn Mass. When sung by a priest without deacon and subdeacon, it's called a misa cantata or a high Mass. And when the Mass is only read in a low tone, it's called a low Mass or even sometimes private Mass. Mass may be offered for any end or intention that tends the honor and glory of God to the good of the Church or to the welfare of men, but never for any object that is bad in itself or in its aims, neither can it be offered publicly for persons who are not members of the true Church. Um, in the Middle Ages, there were some, I'm sure, well-intentioned um, people that were offer, offering Masses for the souls of hell. And, uh, I mean, I'm sure it was done from the motivation of charity, but it's too late for them. They've been judged. They won't be judged a different way. And the Church had to say, you know, no more. We offer Masses for the souls in purgatory, for the living and the dead, but not for the souls in hell. So sometimes people can, you know, request Masses for strange things. Uh, I remember one priest told me that someone in, the, in his parish wanted to have a Mass offered for unity in the Trinity. I said, why would we need a Mass offered for unity in the Trinity? It, 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 the Trinity it is essentially one. There, there's you can't, there, there's, it's not like you need unity in the family, that might be something, there's arguing in the family, but there's, 
there's no arguing with Trinity. I mean, it's, it's God, and that's just, it's not needed. And so sometimes people do ask for some strange requests, and we have to say, okay, well, maybe you want to praise God, you know, for his, you know, being the one and three, maybe we can offer that Mass in, in, in praise of God. All Masses are actually offered in praise of God anyway, but sure, but sometimes intentions need to be tweaked if they're not quite according to what they should be. Uh, a requiem Mass is one said in black vestments with a special prayers for the dead. A nuptial Mass is one said for the marriage of two Catholics. This has special prayers for their benefit. A vote of Mass is one said in honor of some particular mystery or saint on a day that is not set apart by the Church for the honor of that mystery or saint. Um, and there are certain days when vote of Masses can be prayed and other days where it can't be because of the solemnity of a particular feast of the day. Um, but uh, we've all been to vote of Masses, of course. So we may learn that we are to offer up the Holy Sacrifice with the priest from the words used in the Mass itself, for the priest, after the offering up the bread and wine, for the sacrifice, turns to people and says, Orate Fratres, which means pray, brethren, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Father Almighty, and the server answers in our name. May the Lord receive the sacrifice from your hands to the praise and glory of his own name and to our benefit and that of all his holy Catholic Church. The custom of making an offering for the priest for the saying Mass arose from the old custom of bringing to the priest the bread and the wine necessary for the celebration of Mass. Um, it is not simony or the buying of a sacrifice thing to offer the priest money for saying Mass for our intention because the priest does not take the money from the Mass itself but for the purpose of supplying the things necessary for the Mass and his own support. Um, even if you don't offer a stipend, if you ask the priest to say the Mass and he's able to say it, he's supposed to say it, we kind of keep the custom of having Mass offerings now for this reason. Sometimes people, you know, I mean, the Mass is, is you know, such a source of grace that sometimes people want extraordinary numbers of Masses said, and we can't possibly take on, you know, all of the Masses that, that you know, someone wants. Sometimes people want to make, get, you know, let us have like a hundred Masses said for something. But we can't do that. It's not fair. We have hundreds of parishioners who all want their share of Masses. We can't take hundreds of masses from one single person. Um, and so uh, the stipend that, that's given suggested donation of $10 kind of keeps that down. But Father McNeely recently said that someone from California sent a check for, I forget how many masses, and it was the right amount for the stipends, but he had to send it back because there's no way we could have done that number of masses. We just can't possibly do it. It's not fair to our parishioners who also want masses um, for their needs and requests. So we have to be. We have to realize that masses. You know, every every priest is only allowed to say a certain number of masses. We norm. The norm is one mass per day, for the sake of the convenience of the faithful. A priest may say a second Mass on a weekday, or even a third Mass on a Sunday or Holy Day of Obligation, and that's it. No more. And so, you know, there are, Masses are a limited resource for a parish, and so we have to be fair and try to take in, you know, requests for Masses from all of our parishioners. So, um, is there any difference between the sacrifice of the cross and the sacrifice of the Mass? Yes, the manner in which the sacrifice is offered is different. On the cross, Christ really shed his blood and was really slain in the Mass itself. <clears throat> there is no shedding of blood nor real death, because Christ can die no more. But the sacrifice of the Mass 
the separate consecration of bread and wine represents his death on the cross. The chief parts of the Mass are the offertory, at which the priest offers to God the bread and the wine to be changed the consecration, the consecration of which the substance of the bread and wine are changed in substance of Christ's body and blood, and the communion which the priest receives into his own body with the Holy Eucharist under the appearance of both bread and wine. Now, the church since the toward the end of the 20th century has stressed that the Mass is more than just those things. The, um, the reading of you know, the epistle and the gospel and the sermon are considered to be an integral part of the Mass, and the Church's law actually changed to specifically say that it is not sufficient to merely come to Mass by the offertory in order to fulfill your Sunday obligation. Um, that used to be a, an opinion that was given many years ago that if you wanted your Mass to count, you had to be present, uh, and that is for an obligation, you had to be present from the offertory until the priest's communion. That if you weren't for that, that, you, that the Mass was not um, considered to, to fulfill your obligation. But because the Church has the power to bind and loose, she has recently said that that is not sufficient to fulfill your obligation. You must be here at least from the reading of the gospel on Sundays or holy days until the priest's communion to fulfill your obligation. So she extended that. And uh, she has the right to do that. She has the right to do that. The, the, the adhering of Mass, the attendance of Mass on Sundays and holy days is a precept of the church. And the church has the right to change her own law and um, I don't think it's a bad change. I don't think that it's a bad change at all. It's, I think that ideally people should be here from the beginning of Mass and stay until the final blessing and the prayers after, after, after low Mass because to, to, to deliberately come late for a Mass of obligation or leave early for a Mass of obligation is a venial sin. There has to be a reason that we would do that, um, you know. And so, if, if you're even, but even if you're just trying to get in that bare minimum, which you really shouldn't be trying to do, you should probably go for more. You must be here at least from the the proclamation of the gospel until um, the priest's communion. If you um, come late for mass on Sunday and you stay for that Mass, and there's another Mass afterward. To fulfill your obligation, you should, you should attend the next following Mass up to the point where you came in for the last Mass, and that will fulfill your obligation. Uh, the offertory, of course, takes place immediately after the uncovering of the chalice. The part, as um, parts of the Mass said before, are the intro, curia, gloria, prayers, epistle, gospel, and creed. Um, and they correspond with the feast celebrated. The part of the Mass in which the words of consecration are found is called the canon of the Mass. Uh, or the canon of these, of course, is called the Roman canon. And is the most solemn part of the Mass. And is rarely but slightly changed in any Mass. So for certain feasts, we, there are a couple places where we add things for solemnity. But um, it's pretty much the same in every Mass. Following the communion of the Mass, there are prayers for thanksgiving, the blessing of the people, and the saying of the last gospel. Things necessary for Mass are an altar with linen covers, candles, crucifix, altar stone, and Mass book. The chalice with all need, needed, in its use, and bread of flour from wheat and wine from the grape. Vestments for the priest and an acolyte or server, if possible. I've been trying to get an acolyte or serve for the 7 a.m. Mass, but I'm still not having any luck. So the altar stone is that part of the altar upon which the priest rests the chalice during the Mass, 
The stone contains some holy relics sealed up in it by the bishop, and at the altar is of wood. The stone is inserted just in front of the tabernacle. The altar stone reminds us of the early history of the church when the martyrs' tombs were used for altars by the persecuted Christians. From the practice of using martyrs' tombs for altars, we learn the inconvenience, sufferings, and dangers of the early Christians uh, they, were, they were willing to undergo for the sake of pure mass. Since the mass is the same now as it was then, we should suffer every inconvenience rather than the absence from mass on Sundays or holy days. You know, sometimes people say strange things. They say things like, well, you know, I couldn't come to mass last week, Father, because, you know, I had guests. Who had guests? Don't you think that you could have invited your guests to come with you? That might have been an opportunity for them. Or if they didn't want to come, don't you think it would have been a good example for you to go and they would see how important Mass is? Or I didn't go because, ah, oh, my kid had a soccer game. A soccer game? A soccer game is more important than the Holy Sacrifice and Mass, where the Church tells you that if you deliberately miss it, you're in the state of mortal sin. None of these things make sense. Mass is very important, and the church gives an extraordinarily large number of options for times when you can get to Mass. Is it true that some people can't make even those times for important reasons? Well, yeah. There are some people, for example, nurses and doctors who may be on call in hospitals, Policemen, firemen, whatever, they have duties at that time, people in service, whatever. Um, and on the, for those essential um, occupations that don't stop simply because it's a Sunday or a holy day of obligation, then the church says that they are excused. Or, of course, if someone is sick, has sickness or is taking care of someone who's very who's gravely ill and they can't leave them, uh, that would also excuse them. They said weather, you know, if there's two, two feet of snow, you don't have to come to confession the next week and confess that you missed Mass because of the two feet of snow. You know, you, but um, at any rate, if you're choosing to come, there, there's another, another funny story um, in, in, the, in the Bronx. Uh, I was told there was this, this priest went to an Italian parish and uh, they used to celebrate you know, the, the feast of Our Lady of Mount Carmel with great solemnity. It was, uh, it was Our Lady of Mount Carmel Parish. And uh, the, 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 the women many times the next week would come and in their broken English they would say, I couldn't have come to Mass the last week because I had a book. How could I come? I had a book. And the priest the next year said, and I don't want to hear, how can I come? I got to cook. You have to come to Mass. Well, the Italian movie didn't like that. He was moved shortly after that. But anyway, the, he, he was right. He was right. It's not an excuse. And I have to cook is not an excuse for missing Mass. So Mass is very important, and unless there's something extremely uh, necessary or make, making it impossible to attend the Mass, we are bound to go on all Sundays and Holy Days of obligation. Um, there are martyrs from the early church who went out to Mass and were caught by the Romans and were put to death. What are we going to say when those martyrs are standing before the judgment seat on the last day and we're saying, we missed Mass because of the soccer game. The things used with the chalice during the Mass are the purificator of cloth for wiping the inside, the patent or small silver plate used in handling the host, the paw or white card used for the covering of the chalice of Mass, the corporal or linen cloth on which the chalice of the host rests. The host is the name given to the thin wafer of bread used in Mass. The name is generally applied before and after consecration to the large particle of bread used by the priest. Um, 
though the small particles given to the people are also called by the same name. You know, we should know that just some, because something looks like that around host doesn't mean it's sacred. When we get them, they're packaged in plastic in bin, little tubes of a hundred. Sometimes it's hard to get them out. Sometimes they get broken. At this point, they're just bread. What happens if one's broken or one's fall, one falls on the, on the ground when it's not consecrated? We pick it up and we throw it in the trash can. It is not consecrated. Its shape does not make it holy. But once it's consecrated, it's no longer bread. And so I think I told you about that woman who uh, came up and she wanted to receive Holy Eucharist and uh, it, it fell on the floor and she picked it up and she was walking away with it. And I had to go after her and say, excuse me, are you going to consume the host? She said, no, it fell on the floor. Well, now you can't just throw it away. But from her answer, that was what she was planning to do. She didn't recognize the difference. And it's actually an excommunicable offense to simply throw the Eucharist away. Um, but it's not any offense at all that before the consecration, before it's used in Mass, to take the little wafers that come that are still bread, that if they fall on the floor or whatever, just throw them away. So don't be horrified if you see in the trash can, uh, especially in the sacristy, something that it's a host. It's unconsecrated. It's not, it would, it would, no one in his right mind would throw away the blessed sacrament. So a large host is consecrated every Mass, small hosts are consecrated only in some Masses at which they are to be given to the Holy People, or placed in the tabernacle for the whole, for Holy Community faithful. Uh, so the vestments used by the priest at the Mass are the ass or white cloth uh, around the shoulders, signify resistance to temptation. The owl, the long white garments, signify innocence. Cincture cord about the waist to signify chastity. The maniple or hang vestment in the left arm to signify penance. The stole or long vestment about the neck to signify immortality, also the power of office. And the chasuble or long vestment overall to signify charity. Remind the priest of its cross in the front and back, the passion of our Lord. Five colors of vestments are used, namely white, red, green, violet, or purple, and black. White signifies innocence and is used on the feasts of our Blessed Lord, Blessed Virgin, and some saints. Red signifies love and is used on the feast of the Holy Ghost and of martyrs. Green signifies hope and is generally used on Sundays from the 15th of Pentecost. Um, violet signifies penance and is used Lent and Advent. Black signifies sorrow and is used on Good Friday and Mass of the Dead. And gold is often used for white on great feasts. The tabernacle is the house shaped part of the altar where the sacred vessels contain the Blessed Sacrament are kept. Saborium is the large silver or gold vessel which contains the Blessed Sacrament, while in the tabernacle, and from which the priest gives Holy Communion to the people. The monstrance, also known as the Ansensorium, I don't think I've ever heard anyone use that name before. Um, is the beautiful wheel like vessel in which this blessed sacrament is exposed and kept during benediction. If you stay for the nine, and stay afterward, we of course will have expedition and benediction today. Uh, we should assist at Mass with great interior recollection and piety, every outward mark of respect and devotion. The best manner of hearing Mass is to offer to God, offer to God with the priest for the same purpose for which it was said to meditate on Christ's sufferings and death, and to go to Holy Communion. 
to the proper and respectful hearing of Mass is important to be in our place before the priest comes to the altar, uh, not to leave before the priest leaves the altar. Thus, we prevent the confusion and distraction caused by late coming and too early leaving, standing in the doorways, blocking up passages, disputing about places should, out of respect for the Holy Sacrifice, be most carefully avoided. If this uh, book had been written within the last 10 years, they would say, please make sure your cell phones are put on silent. It is a terrible thing, I think, when cell phones go off in mass. Um, people hear, hear notifications that someone has an email or a text message or a ringtone goes off. Isn't God more important than that? Now, don't we have plenty of time to play with our phones outside of Mass? I think we do. So first and most importantly, it's an insult to our Lord. But secondly, it's a distraction to others. Particularly the priest who's offering the Mass. You're distracting all these people. Thinking, and especially when it's, to me, it's even especially when it's during daily Mass. Because you're thinking, you know, you don't have to come to daily Mass. If you're in love with your phone, don't come. Put your phone on silence. There are plenty of people who do need to have their cell phones on them and do need to know if they're getting some kind of message. They're a doctor or whatever. Fine. Have your cell phone on vibrate. That doesn't disturb really anyone. You can still get your notification that's important. Happens. You might need it. But you're not going to need your cell phone to actually be on or have a ringtone. Because that's, it's just a distraction to, to others. Benediction of the Blessed Sacrament is an act of divine worship in which the Blessed Sacrament placed in the monstrance is exposed for the adoration of the people and is lifted up to bless them. The vestments used in benediction are a coat, a large silk cloak, and a humeral veil or shoulder veil. Priests wear special vestments, use a certain ceremonies while performing the sacred duties to give greater solemnity and to command more attention and respect at divine worship, to instruct the people in the things these vestments and ceremonies signify, to remind the priest himself of the importance and the sacred character of the work in which he is the representative of our Lord himself. Hence, we should learn the meaning of the ceremonies of the church. We show that the ceremonies of the church are reasonable and proper in the fact that all persons in authority, rulers, judges, and masters require certain acts of respect for their subjects. And we know that our Lord is present in the altar. The church requires definitive acts of reverence and respect for the services held in his honor and in his presence. There are other reasons for the use of ceremonies. God commanded ceremonies to be used in the old law, and our blessed Lord himself made use of ceremonies in performing some of his miracles. The persons who take part in the solemn mass or vespers are named as follows. So the priest who says or celebrates the mass is called the celebrant. Those who assist him as deacon and subdeacon are called the ministers. Those who serve are called the acolytes, and one who directs the ceremonies is called the master of ceremonies, the MC. The celebrant, the celebrant be a bishop. The mass of vespers is called pontifical mass or pontifical vespers. The vespers are a portion of the divine office or daily prayer of the church. It is sung in churches generally on Sunday afternoon or evening, and is usually followed by a benediction of the blessed sacrament. One cannot satisfy for neglecting Mass on Sunday by hearing Vespers on the same day because there is no law of the Church obliging us under pain of sin to attend Vespers, while there is a law obtaining us under pain of mortal sin to hear Mass. And with that, this is the talk of the Holy Spirit, both